Good afternoon. Hello and welcome to the GRDC Mouse Control webinar. Thank you very much for joining us today. At the moment we have over 80 participants on the call and we're expecting a few more to come in. My name is Kylie Dunstan. I'm the Head of Corporate Affairs here at GRDC. So thanks all for your time. Um, we've got some people joining today via video so you can see the screen and some people joining by phone. So we're going to talk through everything in a fair bit of detail. So before I get going, I'd like to give you a rundown on what to expect today. So Dr. Steve Jeffries is going to kick off with a very exciting announcement from GRDC. This will be followed by an update from the CSIRO on surveillance and forecasts for mouse out mice outbreaks. So we're really lucky today to have a brilliant panel of researchers, growers, tech experts and GRDC staff available and on hand to answer any questions that you have today about mice. So I would really encourage you guys throughout the webinar, there's a little button, a little red icon, a Q&A icon, and any questions that you have, it's down there on the right hand side of your screen. If you're dialing in um, via computer, if you're on the phone, you can't ask questions that way, but we have set up an email address, mice, M-I-C-E, at grdc.com.au, that's mice, M-I-C-E, at grdc.com.au. So you can shoot a question in via that email and you can also hit that red Q&A icon and send a question in at any time. We're going to hear from Steve Syro and then our, ex our expert panel will introduce themselves and then we'll have some facilitated Q&A. So the questions you send in over the next half an hour, we'll, we'll try and get to as many of them we can in the second half of the webinar. So if for some reason there's an um, accessibility problem or you drop out or something happens that you have to stop participating, this event is being recorded and it's going to be made available for download. So we will email all participants with that link to where that is after the webinar. So let's get down to business. Again, a warm welcome to you. Um, I'd just like to take an op an, this opportunity to introduce quickly everyone who's participating in the live webinar. So firstly, I'd like to welcome our Managing Director, Dr. Steve Jeffries, who will be making that very exciting announcement shortly. I'd also like to welcome the CSIRO researchers, Dr. Steve, oh, is it Dr. Steve? No, I just promotion. He's very happy with me. He comes with a pay rise, um, considering we're not paying him anything. <laughs> um, so it's Steve Henry and Dr. Peter Brown, um, who are with the CSIRO. We've also got on the line Richard Murdoch, who's a grower and a Southern Panel member. Ian Hastings, who's chair of the GRDC-supported National Mouse Management Working Group. Ben White, who's an engineer from the Condinen Group, and he's all the way over there in the west, so good, very good morning to you. Paul Lush, a grower from Malala in South Australia. Malala. Malala. See, I'm getting in trouble all over the place here. Um, don't you love live webinars? <laughs> and um, we've got Dr. Ken Young, who's a senior manager for crop protection, on the line as well, who'll be able to answer questions. I think that's everyone. So thanks everyone for joining. Where are we at, Ellie, with numbers? There's 114 of you on the line, so get those questions coming in. So today we're talking about the specific problem of mice. So this is an area where GRDC has invested over 700 million on 50 projects over the last decade. And we've been investing, um, investing recognising that this is a really big problem which has an impact for growers um, all across the country. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Steve Jeffries, our GRDC Managing Director, who's going to touch on how GRDC is um, working to address this problem. Thank you, Dr. Jeffries. Great. Thanks, Kylie. Um, I am really uh, pleased on behalf of the Grange Research and Development Corporation that we have just in the last few days been able to uh, process through our systems uh, and gain approval to proceed with a, uh, an injection of over $4, four million dollars into new mouse control research development and extension initiatives starting very soon. Um, this, of course, the, the initiative uh, is, of course, in response to the, everybody knows, the increasing prevalence of mice in many of our grain-growing regions in Australia. 
we've, we recognise the enormity of the uh, mouse problem and the severe impact that it has on growers' businesses, their families, their communities and their, their overall uh, mental wellbeing. Um, and it has broader, obviously, issues on the, the industry as well. Um, there's no doubt that the, the issue has escalated in, in recent years um, and we need to aim to improve our understanding of why this is in, in fact happened and be able to help identify more effective mouse control options for growers to combat this, this ever increasing and uh, uh, damaging problem. So we're really pleased to announce the new initiative today and it has uh, three key investment areas which will be overall led by CSIRO but will uh, will involve other, other parties as well. Um, the first investment is in the order of uh, a little over three million dollars and uh, this will focus on understanding the mouse ecology, biology and management. Uh, the second uh, part of the overall initiative or new part of new initiative is the sec is to uh, increase our, our ability to, to monitor um, mouse populations uh, right across the na na nation and also to be able to forecast plagues uh, and give plenty of warning to growers so that they can respond. And the third is uh, in regard to mouse feeding preferences as we, we, as we all are recognising that uh, there are this significant issues associated with the current baiting practices. So just touching very briefly on those three components to the new initiative, the first one being the mouse ecology, biology and management uh, part of the initiative. The aim here is, is to invest in providing greater understanding of the behaviour of mice under no-till and stubble retention systems and to quantify the impact that various tillage and stubble retention practices are having on mouse numbers. Where it's really interesting to see that no longer do we have a situation where we have a mouse plague in one year and then due to various circumstances the numbers crash and then we may we, we used to not see, we used to previously did not see uh, populations gaining again until Maybe there was a, a season where we had a lot of summer rain or a lot of uh, extra grain on the ground. That's no longer the case. We're now seeing uh, mouse population numbers retained year on year, uh, which, which there's definitely, therefore, something has changed. And we need to understand what's going on. So we're seeing much higher yielding crops and heavier stubbles that are obviously potentially providing more abundant food source and protection for, for mice. And so the aim is here is to understand those so that we can design strategies to, uh, to help growers manage that situation. The second of the key investments is uh, in the order of about $630,000. And as I alluded to before, it's to uh, broaden and uh, extend our involvement in mouse monitoring and surveillance and the, the ability to be able to offer precise real-time warning of potential mouse plague so that growers can be armed and ready to combat them uh, before they happen as opposed to um, uh, being uh, responsive or after or when it's too late. The, 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 third, the third part of the new investment uh, that uh, the Grains Research and Development Corporation are investing in uh, is uh, in regard to mouse feeding preferences and bait efficacy. Uh, this amounts in the order of about $270,000 and it's to look at mouse feeding preferences uh, and bait, as I alluded to, bait efficacy. Uh, as we know, the broad scale application of zinc, zinc phosphide wheat baits, of course, everyone's doing it by the prescribed rate of one kilo per hectare, is currently our only method available for growers to control mice. But the efficacy of this bait, we all know, has become a, a significant issue for growers. Um, so, this investment aims to explore the conditions which lead to the apparent reduction in attractiveness of the zinc phosphide bait. And, and 
Uh, and we want to ask two questions that relate to the role of the background of food availability on baiting efficacy and whether there are more suitable bait substrates. It appears that mice have an aversion to the wheat-based bait, bait, bait in some situations. Now, this could be due to having much more attractive food sources like pulses, for example. Uh, so GRDC and, its, and CSIRO and other partners will be endeavouring to determine if this is in fact the case. We'll be investigating whether my stockpile are bait, are food sources that, that don't have bait and that they're using this as a survival technique to, to avoid bait. So overall, I want to reassure growers that the GRDC and its partners are, com are committed to exploring all options to provide uh, better alternatives to, for growers to overcome uh, mouse issues. Now, this is only, as, as Kylie was alluded to, these are new initiatives and we're continuing to invest in other mechanisms to uh, help growers uh, uh, manage this, um, this, this serious problem. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the, the hard work behind the scenes of uh, our team of uh, Lee Nelson and Ken Young from our crop protection team here who have been working diligently to get and fast track these, these initiatives. So with that said, um, uh, I'll pass back to you. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks very much, Steve. It's, it's, it's a wonderful announcement and it's really great to see that GRDC is injecting some like $4.1 million into additional mouse control research development and extension. So. I just want to again welcome people. Some people have joined um, while Steve's been speaking. So I'm just going to recap. Um, welcome to the GRDC Mouse Control webinar. We've just heard from Dr. Steve Jeffries about an additional commitment of $4.1 million that GRDC has um, provided to uh, in three initiatives to, that are being led by CSIRO. And um, we're now about to hear from CSIRO um, we've got Steve Henry and um, and Peter um, with us, to, Dr. Peter Brown with us to now give an overview um, of the work that they've been doing um, out on the ground. Now I hear that you've been out in the Air Peninsula, so you've been knee deep in looking at mice. So it's great to have you back in time for the webinar. Thank you. So over to you, Steve and Peter. Thanks very much, Kylie, and uh, thank you to GRDC for this opportunity to, to reach out to, to growers. Um, it's, it's a great opportunity and it's, uh, the timing is, is excellent because, um, as you'll see with this presentation, mice are a, a problem right across um, many parts of the country. And so we hope to provide some practical advice and give you a situation of, of what's coming up at the moment. I just would like to say that there's also a 30 second delay in between what you can see and hear. So, um, so if things seem a little bit disjointed, just count to 30 and it'll all be good. <laughs> so back to you. I'll try and bear that in mind as I change the slides. Uh, but essentially what uh, Steve and I would like to do, um, and, and these presentations are built on the uh, grain research updates that we've been giving lately across Southern Australia. But um, why do we have mouse problem? Uh, mouse problems, mouse plagues, uh, what monitoring are we doing and what are the limitations to those uh, strategies? How can we link that information to, to forecasting outbreaks so we can prove um, when an understanding of when mouse, mouse outbreaks are going to occur? How we can link them with um, different monitoring techniques, um, building hopefully towards um, uh, improved monitoring systems, uh, smarter systems. Uh, we want to go into a little bit of detail about what the current situation is at the moment. And as Kylie indicated, uh, Steve has been going across southern Australia with his routine uh, management uh, monitoring um, trip. Uh, so we get an idea from that. But we're also building in some other knowledge that we've collected from, from other regions to understand what's going on. So what's the problem? What's perhaps driving that? Um, but probably more importantly, uh, what can we do to try and minimise that impact and essentially find out whether um, growers are prepared for that. Um, we're already getting some questions about how we can minimise the impact, so please keep your questions um, coming throughout the presentation and we'll, we'll get to them with the expert panel. 
But just briefly, a little bit about mouse plagues in Australia. Um, the first big widespread mouse plague occurred back in 1904. Mouse plagues are generally characterised, or they're, they're normally quite irregular in their occurrence, and that depends where you are in, uh, across Australia. Um, but for example, normally in southwest, uh, southeastern Australia and Victoria, South Australia, New South Wales, you get a mouse outbreak once every four to seven years. But up in Queensland, it's almost once every two years. And there's a map there, if you, we might have got to that already, but um, there's a pink area uh, showing where mouse, the mouse plague prone area is. Um, but there are outbreaks of mice uh, in Western Australia and areas in Western Australia and also in Tasmania too. So we're not necessarily talking about you know, widespread mouse plagues which cause damage, but it's often these, these outbreaks and, and trying to understand the patchiness of that which we want to try and uh, help inform. So normally mouse plagues are, are a concurrent widespread increase in densities to up to 800 to 1,000 mice per hectare. But after a crash, uh, numbers get very low, so down to five mice per hectare, maybe to 50 mice per hectare. And of course, it's that significant economic damage, which is really what we want to try and manage uh, for growers. I've got a slide here now, which you'll see in 30 seconds, um, about our monitoring we've been doing over many years at Walpi up in northwestern Victoria. This is one of our long-term benchmark sites that we monitor. And you'll be able to see on here that um, there's tremendous increases in mouse numbers uh, and in between times the numbers are very low. A few things to point out here is that uh, these mouse plagues or outbreaks occur, can occur over one year or over two years. And so that has a significant impact on the type of damage that normally occurs uh, to grow these grain growing regions. And it's normally the peak in abundance happens to coincide with sowing of crops in um, in autumn, so in that sort of April to May period, that's when mouse numbers are, are highest. And that's because it's after the end of the breeding season, there's lots of mice, um, and, and that's why we get lots of mice there. Uh, there was a period uh, through the early 2000s into the early 2010-2011 uh, period where unfortunately we were unable to do any monitoring, but certainly there was a, a fairly large mouse plague there um, that occurred at that time. Um, and we've put on the current data that Steve collected last week um, and I've put a little question mark there to say, well, we don't actually know what's happening, but uh, numbers are indicating it's going north and we're definitely in for a problem, which is uh, consistent with the advice and the monitoring and the forecast that we uh, looked at back in September last year after that monitoring. So that's just one site, a Walpi up, and it's kind of representative of largely of a lot of areas. Unfortunately, we don't have detailed knowledge about a lot of areas across Australia. That's just one of the benchmark sites we've got, and we've got two others, one in Malala in uh, North Adelaide Plains and another one in the Darling Downs in Queensland. So the reason that mice are a problem, as we said before, it's that economic damage, and particularly at sowing, that we want to try and manage. But when we have outbreaks that go over two years, it's also the damage through right through the whole uh, crop growing period um, up to harvest. But normally, most significant damage occurs at um, sowing, particularly in the southern states. There's also damage to infrastructure. Mice are one of the few vertebrate pests that invades homes, um, and having to live through uh, mouse plague in rural areas um, is, can be quite horrendous. Uh, we learn to take not the top plate, but the second plate in the cupboard because you know <laughs> mice have been running all over them. And so, you know, there's social impacts of having to deal with it in the field and then coming home and, and dealing with it uh, on, on an ongoing basis quite difficult. There's also some environmental problems when perhaps growers are going too far to try and manage the problem, either using off-label uh, chemicals to manage the problem or going too far with some management and leading to soil loss or, or whatever. So they are, there are tremendous environmental problems too. There's also big issues uh, for intensive livestock industries like um, in piggeries and, and poultry establishments uh, with big increases in mice. Um, so now I just want to move over and I'll hand over to Steve, who's going to talk about some of the monitoring uh, that we've been undertaking. So thanks, mate. Um, so the last uh, point on that previous slide was how good are we at forecasting mouse outbreaks? Um, and to get good at, at, at making predictions about when outbreaks will occur, what we need is as much data about mice as we can possibly get. So the monitoring work that's been um, undertaken over the last five years that's been funded by the GRDC 
has set about to collect as much data as possible on as broad a scale as possible so that we can make some pretty accurate predictions about when we might be expecting mouse outbreaks. Um, we've done this using a number of techniques and the gold standard for collecting information about mouse populations and mouse biology, so when they're breeding and when they're not breeding, is using capture mark recapture data. And we do that by setting traps, and you can see one of the standard traps that we use on the left-hand side. Uh, but that requires us to set 100 traps for three nights, so it's incredibly labour intensive. Now we've set about to get the best value for this data by setting them at, at locations where we have a significant amount of historic data about mice. And so that's on the Darling Downs um, in, in Queensland, uh, at Walkup in northwestern Victoria in the Mallee, and across on the Adelaide Plains uh, just, just out of Malala. And they're the, they're the sites that are, are marked in red on the map. Um, we also set out to do quantitative rapid assessment. And so this allows us to collect data <coughs> way more rapidly um, in a less labour intensive way across a greater range of locations. And you can see on the map there that the sites that are marked in green are the places where we do rapid assessment. And we've got a hundred of those sites set up across Australia. Um, I'm not responsible for collecting data at all of them. I'm responsible <laughs> for the southern zone. So we do, we do work at um, Colliambly, uh, between Hopeton and Horsham, um, between Walty up and Pinaroo, across on the Adelaide Plains, and then we've got another 13 sites on the York Peninsula. So that's, that's a field trip that takes me 11 days um, it's 5,000 kilometres and we visit over 50 farms in that time. So it's a significant effort to collect data on as broad a scale as we possibly can. The idea of using the rapid assessment information is that we can then relate that back to the tracking data and actually start to make some predictions about what might be happening with mice. The third point on that side is qualitative monitoring networks and I'm going to talk about them in a minute. You can uh, move that on please. So at the end of each of these trips, it's one of the really important aspects of our work is communicating what we find to farmers. And so we generate a report, we call them our mouse updates. They come out three times a year after we've finished our monitoring. Uh, these are normally accompanied by a press release from, from the GRDC. Um, the mouse out updates appear on the Feral Scan website, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, but the press releases last year uh, generated over 190 pieces of media in 2017. Um, I've also, in, in an endeavour to communicate the work, set up a Twitter site that is called at Mouse Alert. But, yeah. Now if I flip back to our qualitative um, data that we wanted to collect. One of the ways that we, we endeavoured to collect as much data as possible is to develop uh, what we call the, the Mouse Alert phone app. And the idea of that was to get data from farmers and agronomists on as broad a scale as possible to help us make predictions about um, what might be happening with mice in the future. And you can see that that's available via the Feral Scan website. I'm not going to talk particularly much about that other than to say that it perhaps wasn't subscribed at as high a level as we'd hoped. But what it does enable farmers to do is get on that site and see what's happening with mice in their area if farmers have contributed to it. So the way we had planned to use this data was to lay a grid of uh, across all of the cropping regions in Australia. Um, and for any of the cells in that grid, um, we would use a combination of the mouse alert data, the trapping data and the rapid assessment data in conjunction with environmental variables like rainfall, NDVI or soil type, to calculate the probability, the probability of any grid cell transfer, transitioning from low to moderate, moderate to high, or vice versa. And so that would enable us to provide predictions about what would be happening for mouse numbers maybe two, three months ahead of time to provide farmers with that early warning that they need to be prepared about about um, what might be happening with mice and actually get some of the tools in the shed that they need to deal with them. So is this enough? And the answer is, is clearly no. 
uh, particularly if you consider the nature of last year's outbreak where we had some paddocks, particularly barley stubbles, that had significantly high numbers of mice, um, but other paddocks on the same farm that had almost no mice. And so we had this reoccurring across multiple uh, cropping regions where we had a very patchy outbreak, not a typical or traditional mouse plague, if that's possible, where we had mice flooding across roads, in buildings, in sheds and those sorts of things. So we had what we, a really patchy outbreak. So the upshot of this is we need more data to inform predictive models. We need to develop new methods for monitoring mice so that we can collect way more data. Of course, we need to consider that predicting potential outbreaks is only one part of the solution. And as we've been talking about earlier today, understanding mice in zero and no-till systems will give us a potential edge to be able to target some weaknesses in mice so that we can be, A, more effective about using current control strategies, but B, start to look for some new strategies that might help us to deal with the mouse problem. Okay, I'll Steve. Step back to Pete. Yes, yeah, Steve's handing back to me. And I guess that just reiterates the point that uh, Steve Jeffries uh, made there with the announcements in terms of the investment that GRDC is making to help ultimately try and improve um, management options for mice uh, and the ability to really understand what's going on uh, for growers. Now we want to talk briefly about what the current situation is given uh, the recent data that's been collected over the last several weeks and what that means and uh, what's likely to happen. So there's now a graph on the, on the screen showing uh, for uh, Walpi Up and North Adelaide Plains, the, the two of the benchmark sites. And I've mapped that against uh, historic data uh, from the, the previous monitoring project we had. So we went back to late uh, 2012. Um, two lines there to look at. One is a blue line, which is for the Victorian Mallee, which was very low throughout most of the uh, previous project. Um, and then only in the last uh, 12 months is that those numbers picked up. And you can see that tracking against historic, um, uh, like that says, first year of a two-year outbreak. So uh, it's likely that, well, it is. It's, uh, this is what's happening at the moment. Numbers are very high in that, that Mallee area, uh, tracking similar to what's happened in the past in terms of mouse plagues. Interestingly, in uh, North Adelaide Plains at Malala, over those last four or five years, uh, we've seen numbers um, go up and down. Um, no sort of clear characteristic um, outbreak like we've seen historically. So we're almost in a situation where we've not kind of seen this kind of pattern of uh, change in abundance where we're getting this almost an annual uh, peak in, in numbers. Um, but certainly there in, in South Australia, we're starting to see an increase as well, and, and that's going to cause economic damage at sowing as well. So for um, Victoria Mallee and the North Adelaide Plains, where we've got two of our benchmark sites, we, we, we're seeing uh, higher than normal activity and likely uh, damage um, leading into sowing. Next, we're going to have a, a slide showing our, my interpretation of what the situation is across the country in terms of uh, what the mouse status is and potential risk for, for uh, particularly at sowing. As a map of Australia, the green area is largely where the um, grains are grown, and I've got large areas of, of orange uh, and, and some red, <laughs> a red area showing where there's um, high mouse abundance. Just talking through this just quickly, um, uh, in Western Australia, for example, where we're getting reports from the Ravensthorpe area that numbers are, are higher than normal. So I've got a, a red, uh, sorry, an orange. Um, Lodge, I'd call it. Uh, we don't quite know the extent of it, so it's kind of indicative of, of what's going on. Also in uh, Air Peninsula, another orange splodge because we know that numbers are higher there as well. Then we get into the um, rest of South Australia, into Victoria and into southern New South Wales, and that's where we think the main area of mouse activity is where numbers are highest, and that's where we've got the red splodge, but it's circled by an orange splodge. So we're not quite sure the extent of that again. We're also getting reports up through uh, central New South Wales and also up into northern New South Wales and uh, on the Darling Downs as well that numbers have picked up. And as I said earlier, the, uh, the dynamics of, of mice in um, the Darling Downs is quite different to the southern states. 
almost to the point where there's an outbreak almost every two years uh, in those northern areas. So, and this is not surprising because it was almost two years ago since we had high numbers up there and it's been very quiet in the last year or so up there. So that's our current situation. Um, I guess our message is we really need to go out, have a look, test the situation in your own paddocks to make a decision about what to do. But it looks like in many parts of Australia, mice are certainly much higher than uh, are normally the case. Looking at why that might be the case, um, as we said before, uh, mouse numbers are much higher than normal. And that's come about because of a uh, good season last year, um, uh, reasonably mild weather, uh, and also um, some good rainfall uh, in, in different areas. Um, and for those who can see, there's a photo there showing classic mouse damage uh, on a tillering wheat plant um, just above the node, which we observed uh, in September last year. So our advice at the moment is to largely uh, get out of the vehicle, have a walk through um, paddocks, look for active burrows, uh, look for mouse sign, try and get some measurement of uh, how many mice uh, are there in your paddocks. And, we, and as Steve indicated, it's going to be quite patchy, so each paddock might be quite different. And essentially we want to try and uh, reduce the amount of food that is available uh, to mice. Sorry. Speaking of mouse numbers, we've just started a poll. So while you're listening, if you want to um, answer the little question about how, how you're assessing mouse numbers on your property, that would be fantastic. Just you can click on the poll. So how do you assess your mouse populations? And um, there was just a little hint. So um, if you're not doing it already, you can still answer. We're not going to check. <laughs> Back to you. Well, it's, it's for your own benefit, really, to uh, see what's out there uh, so that you're, you are prepared. Mm, and 53% um, of respondents are saying that they're actively using cue cards, paddock walks and burrow counts. That's so excellent. That That's just getting out. Yay, great. <laughs> We've got some cheering happening in the room here. Yeah. Well, it's Steve's effort and that 190 media releases yesterday. Learned <laughs> <laughs> in vain. And we've had like over 300 or something. Courtney's ran some analysis this year. Yeah. So that's excellent. Yeah, get out, have a, have a walk through, see what's going on. Um, just, it's come to our attention that some people can't actually see the slides. So there is a toggle bar, and a toggle bar is like a little bar that adjusts between the slide screen and the camera screen. So if you can see that little bar, you, you, you have to have a play. So um, there's a little, at the bottom of your screen, it's like, a, it's like a little scale and there's a head on one side and it looks like a clock on the other. And um, just drag it to the right and you should be able to see the slides for those of you who are accessing it. So you can, you can the camera isn't working but the slide screen is. So just have a little play there and keep your eye out for those poles. Um, so we've all we've got a, we've had a passive we've had a switch from actively monitoring passively monitoring um, with a big swing oh it's swinging back to the middle but <laughs> incidental <laughs> sighting and talking to neighbours so stop talking to the neighbours and start checking the paddocks <laughs> back to you okay uh, okay um, so in terms of what we need to do now uh, I think it's really important to try and reduce that food supply because that's that's what's maintaining the, the mouse population. And also, if you want to do any kind of control, particularly with zinc phosphide, we've got to remove that, that alternative food supply. So um, one, one way is if you get rainfall and you're getting germination, spray that out, um, get rid of that food. An option is to uh, put livestock on to reduce that food if it's a part of your system. Other ones might be... Um, trying to bury the food somehow, so a light prickle chain or a small disc, okay. just disc, disc chain, um, or even a speed till or something like that. To, uh, if it's part of your system and you've got the machinery uh, to try and do that, get rid of that food supply. So our first question was actually in relation to this. Growers are wondering if there's something that can be done now other than baiting or grazing paddocks to reduce mouse numbers. Things like cultivation, burning or prickle chaining. I don't even know what that is, so maybe you can enlighten me. But um, we'll come back to that question with the panel. Uh, so given the situation we've got at the moment, um, if you can get rid of that food, our, our advice probably is um, if, if mice are still there, they're active, uh, bait now and then reassess the situation just at sowing. We need to have a gap of between four to six weeks between any zinc, phos zinc phosphide application 
um, now and before sowing because if mice get a, a sublethal dose, they'll be bait averse, they'll behavioural response, they won't touch the bait again. And so uh, having that four to six week window means that those mice have either forgotten about it or there's new mice in the system and they'll be uh, naive to the bait, they'll take the bait. I talk about it having a dodgy curry, you're not going to go back and have another curry again if you get really sick. So just think about that in terms of what a mouse might do. So make sure there's a, a gap between four to six weeks. That's why we're saying have a look now, bait now if you need to. And the other advice we have is if you're baiting at sowing, probably best to do it straight after uh, the sowing, after your, your uh, seed has gone through, whether it's off the back of that system or you're chasing it with a, uh, a bait spreader or something. But it needs to be done within 24 hours of, of sowing because that little bit of soil disturbance at seeding means the mice come out and get active and go searching for that and then hopefully they can find that bait. Uh, and also monitor the effectiveness of, of that baiting. So now I just want to talk briefly about zinc phosphide, which is um, the only registered product for use uh, to control mice. Um, zinc phosphide coated on wheat grains, uh, it needs to be spread at one kilogram per hectare, which is two or three grains per square metre. A lethal dose should be one grain, but maybe mice will take one or two. So there should be plenty of food out there, and I'll explain that shortly, oh, plenty of bait. And with zinc phosphide, there's very few apparent non-target issues because the bait gets ingested and converts into phosphine, phosphine gas, and then it's not available to, um, uh, for secondary poisoning issues. We have had also had a question on how long will it be before there is another broadacre alternative to um, so available. So okay, we'll come back to that we'll come one. Come back to that one. Well. Yep. Um, so it's essentially about about growers being aware of the emerging problem and, and being proactive about those control strategies. And I think um, that, that mindset is changing a lot in the last few years. I now briefly just want to talk about um, what, the, what impact alternative food has on uh, potential bait uptake by mice. And so as we said, zinc phosphide bait is baited one kilogram per hectare, which is those two or three grains per square metre. But if there's residues on the ground, and even if there's, say, 200, 10% of that, 200 grains on the ground at, at sowing, you're competing uh, your two or three grains per square metre against the other alternative food of 200 grains per square metre. So that's why we're emphasising we really have to get rid of that food because if a mouse is out there actively feeding, as they will be, they're going for that, that grain that, that's already out there and it'd be very difficult for them to come across uh, the zinc phosphide bait. So if we get rid of that alternative food, it's going to increase the chance of mice taking the bait and you're having an effect. So we're just going to wind up with a couple of conclusion slides now. Uh, so largely, mouse numbers are higher than normal, and that's uh, virtually across the whole uh, grain growing region. Uh, so that's, and the models we're predicting that there would be an increase in, in, in mouse numbers and a potential at, at sowing this year. Uh, really need to go out and monitor what's happening in the stubbles and try and reduce that food supply if possible. And if you're going to bait, uh, bait now and then leave that four to six window before baiting at sowing if need be. And then the last slide here is um, we're exploring alternative to uh, different types of monitoring techniques. So Steve mentioned the, the chew cards and some people have been using those, that's excellent. And also the active bar accounts. They work mostly in some situations, but not in others. Um, so we we're trying to get a better handle on that, but we're also looking at um, exploring other options for um, monitoring mice in fields. We also are keen to develop better strategies for controlling mice, so exploring other options or improving the, the current technique that we already have, which is uh, zinc phosphide. Um, remote systems I've mentioned. And in the future, um, there's some hope for some novel uh, biocontrol technologies, but that's really uh, quite distant over the, over the horizon. But there are people in Australia and overseas uh, starting to think about those sort of um, actions. I'm going to leave it there as our presentation, but we just had this other slide up that people can look at if, if they want about some mouse biology. But I'll talk a bit about it. <laughs> so mice, uh, they start breeding at six weeks of age. They have litters of up to 10 every 20, 21 days, so three weeks. Okay. They can get pregnant again straight after giving birth, so, um, and then they can start, um, yeah, breeding season starts in early spring. But essentially they're little mouse 
breeding factories uh, under good conditions, uh, we can, you know, a single pair of mice can give rise to 500 offspring in a single season. So we can see what's happening with our models and know what's going on, um, but it's, it's really important to understand that mice have a tremendous capacity to increase um, locally within paddocks and within your farms. And so that's why you need to uh, keep an eye on what's going on so that you're prepared. So it's a big problem and it can escalate very quickly. That's the point, yes, mm. thank you. So thank you very much to Steve and Peter. So please don't forget that you can ask questions at any time by using the Q&A box. We've had over a dozen questions come in and they will be directed to our expert panel. I'd like to now introduce that panel, starting with Ian Hastings. So Ian is the chair of the National Mouse Management Working Group. Ian, can you please briefly tell us about that group and your role with that group? Yes, thanks, Kylie. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Firstly, could I just say that um, as chairman of that group, I very, very much welcome the GRDC announcement today by Steve. Um, the issues that that uh, money is going to be used to look at are issues that have come through our National Mouse Management Working Group. And it's very pleasing to see uh, GRDC so much on board to try and solve some of the problems that we, we've been talking about. My role as chairman, um, I'm there on behalf of Grain Producers Australia, uh, was asked to take on the role and um, as a grower, and there are a number of other growers on the mouse management working group, we try to ensure that um, the issues from a grower perspective are raised at that, um, that working group's meetings. And, uh, you know, sometimes we see the world slightly differently to some of the researchers and we just need to ensure that uh, all points of view are taken into account. So our meetings, or the reason for the uh, working group and, and my role as chairman is to um, talk about all sorts of options that are available to us for controlling mice, um, to try and ensure that we have a knowledge of what is happening throughout Australia in terms of mouse numbers. And of course, to be concerned about both the availability of bait and also the price of that bait so that we're trying to um, assist farmers making the right decisions in terms of using the correct bait at a reasonable price to control the mice instead of uh, looking at other alternatives. So um, I, I see my role as to be part of bringing all of those um, points of view together and trying to ensure that uh, everything that is required is being done. Um, so yes, it's, it's a good group. Um, and we've been lucky to uh, be able to keep it going for a while and, and hopefully achieve some things. And as I say, the announcement today by GRDC certainly covers some of the issues that we've been raising. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, we really appreciate your intro and the role that you have on the GRDC-supported National Mouse Management Working Group. I'm going to um, do the intros now for Richard Murdoch, Paul Lush and... Um, Ben why We've just got lots of questions pouring in, so I'll give you an overview of those guys. So um, Richard Murdoch is um, a GRDC panel member in the South, and as we know, farmers across the country are in the front line, and um, Richard is um, on the York Peninsula. So we, we know that there's um, been you know, severe mouse outbreaks in that area. So thank you for being on the line, Richard, to answer any questions that we have. Um, introducing also Paul Lush. So Paul grows wheat, canola and lentils on 3,000 hectares of mixed soil. Um, and so thanks, Paul, Paul, for joining us today. And Ben White. So Ben is um, hailing from the West and he's an agriculture engineer. So these guys are going to um, also share with us some of the um, in their in the Q and A session some of the equipment that they're using and some of the innovative solutions they're applying um, to control mice numbers in the regions. But kicking off with the questions, so on the panel joining Ian, Richard, Paul, and Ben are of course Steve um, and Peter from CSIRO and Dr Ken Young from GRDC to talk about our investment portfolio. But considering we've got so many questions and only 15 minutes to go, I'm going to um, flick to the first question. And the first question I alluded to during the CSIRO presentation, that growers are wondering if there's something that can be done now other than baiting or grazing paddocks to reduce mice numbers. Things like cultivation, burning and prickle chaining. So over to maybe CSIRO to to have a first crack and then we might head to our grower panel. 
Yeah, thanks for that question. I mean, really need to reduce that food supply, which is what we talked about before. I mean, burning is an option, but whether that's uh, considered appropriate and you've got the, the window to do that and you can, you can manage that um, if it gives benefit, uh, other benefits. Uh, we talked about prickle chaining, uh, speed tilling, uh, those kind of activities. Um, essentially, if that somehow buries whatever residual food is available, um, it might also reduce some of the cover and that increases predation risk against the, the mice. And that all has uh, effects on how the mice might, might behave and, and uh, reducing that food and, and making uh, applications of zinc phosphide more, more beneficial. That's essentially what we want. But do we want to see Yeah, what? so um, Ian, Richard, Paul or Ben, do you have any contributions on um, other strategies in relation to um, reducing numbers? Oh, look, I'll uh, kick off if you like. Um, Perfect, can uh, you just... Here. Oh, good. Thanks, Ben. Yep. Uh, look, I just I suppose one of the one of the issues is, and I was a little bit alarmed with some of the uh, uh, the food supply uh, figures that were shown there. Um, a, a lot of this work probably also needs to be done at harvest. It looks like we're throwing a fair bit of uh, potential food for mice out the back of the harvester. That's not something we can do anything about immediately. And um, speed killers, uh, Kelly chains, prickle chains uh, uh, can get across a lot of ground pretty quickly and it sounds like that might be uh, a good way to go in the short term, um, failing the, the baiting side of things. Yeah, Thanks, so, Ian. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, Ian. Yeah, Thanks, Paul, actually, yeah. Just we'll go <laughs> to Ian and then Paul. Okay. Thanks. Okay. The, um, the prickle chain speed tiller idea in, in my part of the world, in the, uh, the Mallee, we're very cautious these, at this time of the year in doing anything to reduce or, or uh, allow uh, soil erosion to occur. So in lots of ways, livestock is our best option to try and reduce some of the amount of grain on the ground. And I would just like to add, while I've got the chance that given that in, in the part of the Mallee that I belong to anyway, we're only one to two weeks away from seeding. So at this stage, I suggest the best um, method for people to control mice in our situation is to wait until we've, we've run the seeder over the paddock and if possible, put the mouse bait spreader on the back of the seeder and do it immediately behind the seeder. I don't believe you have time. Um, Peter said before you need four to six weeks between bait applications and we don't have that amount of time left. So my advice would be to work very hard to get the uh, spreader set up on the back of the seed bar and do it then. Perfect, thank you, Ian. And over to you, Paul. Yes, uh, in regards to um, the amount of food on the ground, uh, it's quite interesting. We, we ran a Harrington seed destructor behind the head of this year, on the head of this year. And even where we've, we were very diligent in not putting anything out there, the rotor at the header, and we've demolished everything coming off the sieves, we're still seeing numbers, alarming numbers of mice where I would consider we've virtually got no grain on the ground. And I would consider that the mice have been living on ryegrass seeds and the, the small amount of stuff that we've left behind. Um, and we're in a full stubble retention, stripper front, um, single disc seeder sort of operation. So I suppose we could be considered a prime farm for mice. And where we discussed, we've got rid of all the food, we're still seeing mice numbers. And that, um, that actually um, relates to an, another question that we've got here, that saying that feed load is actually lower now than it was in 2017, yet mouse numbers are higher. So is this, is this something that you guys want to address? Yeah, look, I think that's a, that's a, a really good question. But you know, when we get figures of you know, 20,000 20, brome grass seeds per square metre, um, significant numbers of rye grass seeds per square metre, as well as the stuff that goes off the front of the header. And when you take into consideration that mice need only three grams of food per day to survive, it doesn't take a heck of a lot of food in the system to actually sustain a reasonable population of mice. Three grams isn't a lot. It's not a lot of food. But these issues around covering up food and, and those sort of practices are Give you, also give you an opportunity to get out and see what's happening because essentially if you've turned over the top of the paddock, you've set the paddock surface to zero and then if you back out monitoring after that, you can see how many mice are breaking out of burrows, what the activity level is and it gives you a really good opportunity to target them. So can you just give a recap, what's the most effective way then of covering the food? 
Ah, look, that's still, we need to do research to discover that. <laughs> okay. But I mean, I mean, lots of, lots of guys who have been um, no-tilling for a number of years now are starting to look to things like disc chains and those sort of activities to basically reset the paddock back to level. Um, it's, a, it's a huge decision to make in terms of the whole uh, ethic of no-till farming. And so if they're doing that, that's an opportunity to seize on to control mice. Look, um, I'm going to Richard. Did you have anything to add? We just haven't heard from you in this in this question. Yeah, look, probably a couple of things that um, speaking to other growers, they've uh, um, gone ahead with speed tilling. Just they've got uh, haven't been able to control it with bait, so they've used that to try and minimise their uh, supplies. But probably the other one comment I wanted to make was regarding the prickle chaining. In some areas where there is good stubble uh, retained. Uh, uh, it has been used following the cedar and, and effectively it disjoints the, the mice ability to move along the row, um, following the seeds in the row. But uh, perhaps I'll highlight at that point that um, obviously uh, prickle chains and uh, some of the new uh, um, configurations of chemical using it could quite well be damaged from chemicals. So people want to be pretty aware of that, I think. Excellent, thank you. Um, I just want to thank everyone for their questions. Please keep them coming in. Um, I'm just going to group three questions together here, and they relate to the, the the silver bullet or the magical the magical chemical alternative to um, zinc phosphide. So we've had a few questions. Um, where we know that zinc phosphide is not particularly effective. How long before another broad acre alternative rodenticide will be available? A lot of money has already been spent on this alternative. Where is the return from growers? Just before we answer, related to this question, and Ken, I'm going to throw to you to answer um, about GRDC's past investment firstly. Um, but just the, the, the second question related to this topic is, are you seeing any evidence of mice, mice preferences for different zinc phosphide baits? A Twitter post from now, and I'm going to get laughed at again for pronun my pronunciation, but Pinaru, South Australia last week showed all triox and, un, and an unsterilised um, zinc phosphide bait consumed after day four, but another zinc phosphide sterilised bait only about 50% consumed. So there's some stuff about you know the the efficacy there. But um, and are there any chance in getting you can say that strychnine strychnine or 1080 as a bait again to increase the success of baiting. So we're going to answer these questions in a batch and Ken, can I ask you to kick off in relation to GRDC's past investments in other um, chemical solutions and um, why can't we use some of these, um, these alternatives? Okay, thanks Ken. Carly. Thanks Carly. Um, the, the past investments have looked at a range of actives. Um, now those actives have been counted out for for numerous reasons. Um, some have just been is on cost that they're just miles too expensive to put in a broad acre situation. But the majority have been knocked out because of toxicology and off target damage. So things like your strychnine in 1080 um, can't be used because of off target damage and secondary poisonings. But can you just talk a little bit the, more going, about toxicology and, and the off label damage? So, why are they not an alternative? Well, there's just straight, there's some straight toxicology problems with some of them um, from a human health point of view. Others is that there, there isn't enough bait um, or toxin on the, to be able to put on a grain to actually be, offer a lethal dose to the, to the mouse. Um, and when the off-target damage is, is, is the secondary poisonings um, with, with non-target species, you know, including birds and other, other um, native animals and areas. And so the environment would not, you know, when they're assessment by the regulator, they're, they're, not, they're not passed beyond that point. Where we are at, where we're at with, where we're at with in the discovery platform. So it's, it's any discovery takes a long time. Uh, so any work we're starting now still is going to be at least you know, eight, possibly 10, 12 years away before it gets through all the toxicology and environmental tests. So we've been working over the past um, eight years, said narrowing down, unfortunately narrowing down our pool of actives. 
we, uh, we, we got down to, well, we've actually got down to only one still being um, uh, on our list. And that is in early toxicological state, um, tests um, being done in the States. And it's in being done, we're doing this in conjunction with the USDA, you know, it's the United States Department of Agriculture, because they also have rodent problems up over there, not necessarily mice, um, slightly larger animal called a vole. And so we're working in conjunction. So we're trying to, you know, I suppose, getting value adding out of the growers levies with other investments, um, people tackling similar problems. Um, you know, the, the tests that we do that are being done over there will determine whether the active we're left with has got a way to go. Um, some of the actives, things like silver nitro, which we used, was is one of the ones which we just couldn't get enough of that on a bait um, to cause damage um, or to kill, to kill mice. That, that, that toxin is being used in the new um, dog and pig feral baits. Um, but they just can't be, we haven't found a delivery system for them to go onto mice. So that's another opportunity for us to look at, okay, well, if silver nitro can be used, do we look at another delivery system other than using a grain? Now, you also asked the question about um, prefer bait preference. Uh, the differences between um, the bait substrate with different zinc phosphides, that's the work we're just about to start. We know from anecdotal evidence, um, and evidence from our research is that there is a preference um, in food from, um, by mice, you know, whether it's um, having a preference to barley over, over, over a wheat grain or a preference to lentils or, or other things. Now, whether by they're getting used to the feed that's in the paddock, so if you had a, a barley paddock and they've been happily feeding on barley, then you're putting wheat out, they still prefer barley. Um, that's the work we're trying to trying to address to see. Well, okay, what is what what changes their palatability? Um, how much of a deterrent is by having a bit of zinc phosphate on the grain? Um, so yeah, it's work in action. I'm sorry. Okay, Ken, that's a, a great response. Thank you for providing clarification. So does that mean that the GRDC investment in in those areas um, is a waste of money? It hasn't been a waste of money. Um, all these, any discovery investment is is got a, a risk about it. We're not being able to be able to produce something in onto the market, but obviously it has closed doors, which, as in some cases, it might mean opening other doors and looking at a different delivery system. So we've got a lot more information than we had in the past, and we'll be able to you know narrow down our search and hopefully, you know, provide. Um, better information and fast track next time we get a, an active which is is, is showing um, less secondary poisoning still very effective and it's also cost, cost effective. Perfect thank you Ken um, you know and that's the whole premise of research isn't it just what you prove even if it doesn't work is sometimes just as valuable as um, as as the alternative. So I've just got Dr. Steve Jeffries who'd just like to... I just, I just wanted to add something to that to what Ken just said. Um, look, research is about taking risks and we recognise that this is a very serious uh, problem, both economically and also socially as well, to farming families. It is a very emotional situation. We seriously recognise that. We recognise we need to take more risks as much risk as we can possibly do to find solutions to it. So, um, and not all of those things are going to win. We're not going to win, but if we don't take the risk, we're not going to find those novel solutions. Perfect, thank you. So is it okay to spread mouse bait and snail bait together preceding? I'd like to take that one. <laughs> um, absolutely not. Why? Um, so, as Peter was talking about earlier, the, the issues associated with beta version. Yeah. Um, what so, do you mean beta version? So if you're spreading um, snail bait and mouse bait at the same time, and it's equally distributed across the paddock, a mouse has an equal opportunity to take a snail bait as it does to take a mouse bait. Now, if it takes a snail bait and all it gets is a belly ache, Oh. then the chances of it eating any other novel food that you've introduced to the system are very low. So it's really important to get that mouse bait out before you get your snail bait out. Um, and, and, and give your mouse bait a couple of weeks before you go with your snail bait. It sounds really easy to mix it up and spread it all in one go, 
it's probably reducing your effectiveness quite significantly. So how long do you have to wait? Oh, look, I'd, I'd be waiting a couple of weeks. What would you, Pete? Oh, at least a week. I mean, you need the right endocide to have an effect. I think mean, it's an acute right endocide. They should die within one or two days. Um, yeah, and then bait after that with a snail bait. Look, we've still got questions pouring in, so I'm just going to um, invite the panel to participate for another 10 to 15 minutes, if that's okay. We understand if callers have got other commitments and need to drop off, but we will do our best in the next 10 or 15 minutes or so to answer what questions you have, because we really appreciate you taking the time to participate, and we understand that this is a really serious issue and you've got questions that you want answered. So for as long as you're, you've got those questions pouring in, we're going to try and whip through them. So what is being done about base baiting pasture paddocks? It's a, it is a problem when you're cropping and then through the fence, you're being continually reinfested. So what can people do about that? I'll, I'll have a go at that initially, I suppose. Um, in terms of management of mice, I used to talk about managing over a large area. So think about the whole farm as, as, as a, um, a management unit. And that could be, you know, 1,000 hectares, 2,000 hectares or whatever. It could be because if you manage over a large area, you're going to reduce the chance of mice reinvading from neighbouring paddocks. So rather than treat small paddocks, think about a much larger area where you're going to undertake this management and perhaps also coordinate with your neighbours so that when you do management, it all happens at roughly the same time so that you're reducing that chance of reinvasion from mice coming in from outside. Okay, and how many grains... Of, of, of treated grains, does a mouse need to eat before it's effective? Uh, it should be one one grain is one lethal dose, but there is evidence of mice eating more than one grain. Um, and if you think about if the grain goes out at two or three grains per square metre, that's equivalent of um, 20 or 30,000 lethal doses per hectare. And as I said before, during a mouse plague, mouse numbers are 800, maybe 1,000 mice per hectare. There should be at least there should be plenty of bait that goes out to, to manage those mice. So there could be, there should be about 10, 10 grains, you know, per mouse. Even if they harvest them, <laughs> 10 grains, there st still should be plenty out there if the mouse numbers are like that. So I, um, I am conscious of the fact that the CSIRO team is sitting in front of me, so it's a tendency to look to them for answers. So Ian, Richard, Paul or Ben or Ken, do you guys have any um, additional strategies for dealing with, um, you know, being adjacent to pastures or efficacy of, of getting mice to eat bait? Kylie, uh, Richard here. We, uh, one of our strategies after baiting um, the second time around, uh, especially fence lines, uh, roadsides, and we've got quite a bit of treed ridges, etc. We'll, we'll just do a border bait, you know, uh, as a second baiting uh, just because of the heavier populations there and uh, it's just the, the, the mice are being housed there. Okay, um, and Paul or Ian or Ben? Yes, it's Paul here. Um, interesting, last year we, we actually baited our whole farm and then we actually had paddocks that were quite good and then we had neighbouring paddocks that were burnt. And then within two or three days our crop had disappeared because those mice actually migrated from the burnt paddock into you know our stubble ground or in this, in this case it was wheat sown back onto wheat which was actually wrapped off at ground level so that it was not like there was a lot of cover there and all of a sudden within two or three days we had to rebate and uh, in some cases they nearly wiped out strips because they, they just moved from one paddock to the other it was just truly amazing okay have you got something are you, Yep. Yeah, I, I think Richard's um, comments and, and strategy is probably the one that I would recommend. Uh, also, you know, a, a, a blanket um, baiting if you have a paddock that requires it, and then uh, when you're concerned about something coming in from from somewhere else, i.e., a patch of trees or the next paddock, do a border bait. And border baiting? Is there any tips on border baiting? Well, you have to be careful what the label says because I think it says you're not allowed to bait uh, where there's where there's trees and things and there's a, a buffer area of 30, 50 metres. I can't remember what it is, but um, and that's largely to protect non-target animals, uh, birds, granivorous birds coming down and, and taking that bait. So I'm just saying caution around trees. Obviously, that's where there might be some mice, but um, we have to be careful about what the label says. And of course, the other thing to be cognizant of in, in in these situations where 
where you where you're reducing food in one area as soon the thing that drives mice to to move is a lack of food and so they're not going to range a long way if they've got enough food close to home so be aware that every time you remove food from a system mice will then start to range further to find alternative sources of food and that is potentially a, a great time to target them with a bait application. So when you get a fire or when you've burned a stubble, start to think about those times as times to target mice because they're out roaming around. Okay, so just look, talking about how we can count um, mouse numbers, is there a good way to quickly count a current infestation? Well, the two methods we talked about before that Steve uses with his rapid assessment, one is mouse chew cards. So um, those 10 by 10 centimetre cards with a grid marked on it, setting out on a transect about 30 metres in from the edge of the crop. Um, and what that does is, and, and also, sorry, the um, active uh, burrow counts, but either way, they get, get you walking through the field looking for mouse activity and you get an understanding of what's going on. If you use the cards, um, we find that they probably don't work as well when there's lots of abundant alternative food and active burrows aren't necessarily really good if there's lots of ground cover because you can't see the burrows. So there's limitations to them, but they still get you out walking through the field. Another good one is uh, after you get a shower of rain, just looking for active uh, digging of, of burrows, uh, you can see the fresh diggings as well. So they're, they're the, probably the, the key ones that can be used. Look, and there's another question here, on where can we get chew cards? Well, I'm pleased to announce that GRDC is sending out to every grower in Australia um, some chew cards, a pad of chew cards with an instructions, instructions on how to use them in the next edition of GRDC's Ground Cover magazine. So keep your eyes peeled and don't, don't just throw away the inserts. Please have a look and um, get your chew cards in the next edition of Ground Cover. So just an update on the active burrow counts. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think if you go to the GRDC website for the tips and, tips and tactics for controlling mice, we talk about uh, 100 metre long transects that are one metre wide and counting all of the active burrows that are in that one metre strip. A really important thing to be aware of is don't be tempted to add a single active burrow in if it's sitting just outside your transect. Because if you do that, you're adding one burrow per 100 square metres, which is 100 burrows per hectare. So be really cognizant of not adding a burrow in just because it's sitting just outside that one metre width, because it'll make a significant difference to your count. So be aware of those kinds of things. Stick to the rules. Okay, so some growers last season suggested they'd followed all the guidelines and have used all of the available information with fact sheets and media releases. They want to know, is there anything new and can you give an understanding of why, if they've done the right thing, they still have bad mouth problems and can they do anything different? So, well, yeah, that, a few different questions there. The holy grail, isn't it, really, to understand uh, how to, to manage mice properly, but it, it's about managing that food supply, reducing cover, uh, using strategic use of, of bait um, when, when is necessary, whether we're getting into it and, and undertaking that over a large area as well. Um, whether we're seeing a change in the nature of mouse plagues now with the new farming systems or not, we don't know. And that's what some of this, this work is that um, Steve Jeff Jeffries mentioned earlier, that we want to start to address some of those key questions. So we're taking them on board, we're listening to them. Um, but at the moment, you know, this is our best advice to, to really try and manage the situation as best you can, knowing that not everything's going to work in every situation as well, but at least you know, you've got to try these things. So Ian, Richard, Paul or Ben or Ken, do you have anything else to add on that one? Well, yeah, it, just to oh, back so Peter Richard, up. And then I think it was Paul. Oh, I think it was Ian, sorry. Oh, Ian, yes. sorry. <clears throat> yeah, I said no, nothing to add, thanks. Oh, thanks. And Paul? Uh, the only thing I'll add is um, we've been trialling, or not trialling, we've been baiting in the springtime um, and keeping our mum numbers lower going through summer. And, and we did our whole farm last year in the springtime when we saw wheat being chewed off and canola pods disappearing. So another thing to look at is, is controlling our numbers 
going into the end of spring when our crops are flowering and trying to keep those adults down in low numbers as, as we enter into summertime. So that's all I'll add is that that seems to be pretty effective. And thank you for that, Paul. Um, just before I hear from Ben and Richard, someone has just said, is there info on monitoring and control that's controlling the crop in during spring, please? Is there anything to do differently during spring? Monitoring, you mean? Or the info, they want info on monitoring and control in crop during spring, please. Uh, well, it, it's still largely the same. I mean, you probably don't want to drive across your crop when it's um, maturing like that. Um, but there is an opportunity in terms of how the crop is developing before it uh, reaches head. Mm -hmm. So once the, the crop matures, that's when that food, uh, alternative food increases and the baiting and other mechanisms for monitoring and, and control are going to be less effective. So try and do something before crops are flowering or something like that uh, is, is a good time to do things. <clears throat> Anything to add, Ben? Uh, yeah, look, I, I thought I might just uh, talk about the challenge of applying two to three seeds uh, or two to three grains per square metre um, or a kilogram per hectare, that's a, a very, very low rate. And uh, i just point out that um, calibration is quite essential and, and uh, making sure that you're not putting too much out uh, and or equally not putting enough out, uh, it's essential to get that calibration right. So, um, but, so how do you do that, do that then? Uh, Look, calibration is pretty simple, time, um, take a, a weight measure over time and then calculate your speed. Um, in most cases, most uh, small broadcast 12 volt spreaders have a, uh, a guide as to um, you know, what orifice size um, that they should be shut down to. Um, and in that case, it, you, know, you should probably follow that guide and then adjust accordingly. Um, Further challenges, obviously, with uh, with your larger spreaders or belt spreaders that some people are using, um, modifications that farmers have taken uh, on board with those, and and um, and put um, adaptations on on the inside of those to uh, to actually use their large uh, belt spreaders um, and and get across the keep it of ground pretty quickly with a 36 metre uh, wide spread, um, as well as some other adaptations that farmers have taken on board. So you know, that that uh, application can be challenging, um, but it, uh, calibration is your best friend in that instance. And is there a good spreader for mounting on a cedar bin? Yeah, look, there's a range of. Uh, of uh, small 12 volt um, broadcast spreaders that will do out to about 24 metres. Uh, um, they're pretty low cost. Um, most of those uh, get mounted to the bar. Um, if you've got, say, a, a tow between bin, uh, if you've got a tow behind bin or air cart, then you can uh, you can mount those small 12 volt spreaders to that. Um, most of those have an electric uh, an electric shut off, so you can control them um, from the cab, or you can get them to uh, turn it on and off. Uh, as the cedar kicks into gear. So um, a, a few different options there uh, in, in terms of uh, machinery and equipment, Kylie. Perfect. Now, I'm just going to ask um, Ian, Richard or Paul if you've got anything to add to that before um, before we move on and we're going to wrap up in a few minutes. Yeah, Ian here. Um, I, I heard what Ben said, but I, I do believe that that um, calibration and the equipment that we use on the back of the cedar bar is, is very critical. It, it is actually very difficult to reduce one of those spinners down so that you're only covering, say, 12 metres or 17 or 18 metres, um, and at 10 kilometres an hour, you've got to screw it down very hard. Um, I think that's an area where we really do need to work a better, work out a better way, some sort of a system which drops the grain onto the spinner rather than sitting on the spinner and, and uh, almost getting hot while it's waiting to go out the small orifice. So that's an area that I'm I'm going to be pushing for us to do some further research. Uh, Kylie, if I, I can add a little bit to that, if you like. Um, yep, yep. There are who, who, uh, a couple of farmer... So, so, sorry, Ben here. Thanks, Ben. Sorry. Sorry, Kylie. Uh, yeah, look, there are a couple of adaptations that farmers have made where they have put something inside a, a conventional belt spreader um, and, and metered from that, um, and that gets around that, that problem that you were saying, Ian. Um, it does help quite a bit. So, Yeah, can I chip in there? This, this is a subject that I, I hear a lot about because I'm talking to farmers a, a lot. So three times a year I ring 50 farmers and talk to them about mice. Um, and this is a reoccurring theme, the issues about rate and controlling rate and frustration around um, either getting out at when it's due to fill and finding the bin full or finding the bin empty and not knowing when it's gone empty. 
um, and the issues associated with churning bait in spreaders and, and potentially sloughing um, zinc phosphide off the grain as it sits churning above the spinner. Um, and so this is an area that we could potentially do some work into. It, it shouldn't be an intractable problem. It should be something that we could solve quite quickly. Um, and, you know, things like putting cameras in, in spreader bins and those sorts of things are, are questions that we can start to, to answer. And I think it's probably potentially in scope of the research that we'll be doing in the next next year. That's wonderful. So thank you. I'm just going to close by, there's a couple of questions that are, um, I'm batching together again, and I'm going to direct this one to Ken. Speaking of spreading, can we get registration to use a higher rate of spreading? Um, going to a higher rate um, will, will require a bit of work in, again, looking at off-target damage. Now, the, the question really is, do we really need to go to a higher rate? And that really gets back to the feed supply. So even if you doubled your rate and you went to to four, and having four, I think, sorry, Peter, I'm getting my numbers wrong here, getting four seeds per square metre, you used to about 100 seeds per square metre there, you really haven't made a lot of impact. But doubling your, your cost um, with not that much extra efficacy. So, yeah, um, we, you're not sure that by doubling, going to a higher rate is really going to um, be very, very effective. So it might not solve the problem, but it might just add additional cost. Correct. Okay. So, Ken, while I've got you um, there, the next question relates to why was registration for grain baited oh, jingos, broma, yes, bromodialone, uh, as a perimeter bait removed? Um, again, due to secondary poisonings, concerns about secondary poisoning. And um, I'm not sure who can answer this one. It might be you, Ian, I'm not sure. But why is there no accredited bait mixing stations in Victoria? <laughs> yes, I can answer that. Um, it has become a real problem trying to get all of the um, all, all of the uh, elements lined up, all of the places that need to give approval. Um, however, I do also need to say that there is now a number of bait um, options within the borders of Victoria or just on the very edges. So, uh, yes, we do have to travel a little way, but there is uh, relatively correctly pr priced bait available at uh, some commercial outlets and there is opportunity to take your own grain and have it mixed um, just around the borders of Victoria. So whilst it is a problem, it's not uh, something that should stop the bait going out in Victoria. Look, uh, look, I just want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for their participation in the seminar. I am conscious that we've gone a little over 15 minutes over time, but that is in direct response to the questions that have been flooding in. We haven't got to a couple of questions and we will um, do a Q&A and make that available on the GRDC website. And as I mentioned earlier, this is being recorded. We will send an email out to participants with a link to this recording and um, where you can where you can watch or listen and um, with those additional Q and A. Look, I'd really like to thank the entire panel for making yourself available and for um, participating today. But but more, we've we've called we've organised this webinar in direct response to the severity of this problem throughout Australia. So we really appreciate everyone's participation for taking the time to dial in, to ask questions, to um, answer our poll, which incidentally turned out that it was about 50-50 active passive monitoring. And so um, thanks for thanks for it, all of the info help. Um, as I said, there are a couple of questions we haven't had a chance to answer, but we will make those answers available on the website. Thank you all for your participation. Um, please keep vigilant and um, we will work to continue to provide you the best information, tools and advice that we can to help you um, address this very severe problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.